everybody. We're going to get started. I'm going to keep my eye on the chat box. Um, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, your video and your microphone has been muted so that we can have everybody comfortable and protected from any kind of video bombings that might occur. You do have the ability to chat with me privately and at the end of the session I will go through and try to cover any sort of questions that come up um, and, and I will address those publicly where at all possible so that everybody can hear the question as well as the answer. So I do appreciate everybody being with me. I am Dr. Whitney Elmore. County Extension Director for the University of Florida Pasco County Extension Office and I'm also the Urban Horticulture Agent. So I want you all to kind of sit back, try to relax as much as you can for the next hour or so with me and let's talk about building resilient turf grass. So what I'm going to do in this particular talk is focus in on St. Augustine grass and Bahia grass which are our most common, our most popular um, utilize grass throughout the state of Florida, but especially in Central Florida. If at the end anybody has got zoysia grass, and a few people might that are on here, it's not nearly as common, I do have a couple of slides that I can show and we can work through some um, of the advantages and disadvantages um, and specifics of that grass as well. So if zoysia is um, out there in your lawn, hang tight, we will definitely be able to cover some information about it. But the majority of the um, circumstances and management techniques apply across the board to our warm season turf grasses. So, Okay, hopefully, can you hear me now? Not sure what happened there. Okay, we're back. All right, we'll keep an eye on that potential problem with the mute. So what I was saying is we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each of these turf grasses. Um, and, and it's a good time to have this discussion because we're we're still in our seasonal drought period. So some of you may be looking to rejuvenate your lawns, maybe redoing them completely. Um, but you you may also just be dealing with some of that seasonal drought, which is normal. It's been a little bit more extensive this year, but the last couple of days we've gotten some good rains. And as we head toward June especially, we'll start to head back into our normal period of um, afternoon rainfalls. So I'm also really going to focus in on what I call the three ifs. The three ifs in turf grass revolve around irrigation, fertilization and shades. And like I've got on here, the ifs and buts will make you go nuts. Um, and this is where we tend to see a lot of frustration. There's a lot of bad information that's out there, a lot of confusion, especially for folks that are transplants, find themselves coming down um, from up north where the turf grasses are different, very different species, very different management techniques into a very different climate. So you kind of flip things on its head when it comes to turf grass as well as any gardening um, procedures in Florida. So things are kind of flipped and what you might do in other parts of the country really doesn't apply here and can really um, do you a, a disadvantage, especially with your turf grasses. So I'm going to focus in on those particular um, categories and then we'll get over into some tips about mowing and thatch as well. So um, I'm seeing Bruce might have some issues with audio. Everybody still hearing me? We may have to do this a couple times. Okay, thank you, Amy. So we'll move we'll move on here. So um, sorry, Bruce. Hopefully um, that will be resolved shortly for you. All right. So let's move over here and discuss the advantages of St. Augustine grass. 
St. Augustine grass is by far our most popular turf grass. It kind of has that old Florida feel to it. It's a wide bladed grass, very coarse, um, but it tends to look really good. Um, when it's healthy, it's a deep, dark green color, um, and, and it does very well um, across Florida, especially Central Florida. It's very tolerant of a wide range of soil pHs, which is nice. Now, let me explain a little bit about what I mean here with soil pH, because this is a critical point. So soil pH is a characteristic of the soil that affects whether or not a plant, not just turf grasses, but any plants ha can take up nutrients. So plants make their own food using photosynthesis. So we don't supply food through a fertilizer, we supply nutrients. Just like our bodies need nutrients to build, maintain, reproduce, so do plants. Now they make their own food, whereas we have to go out and get it, um, and we need to supply nutrients to help them make food, to grow, to reproduce, to develop, to repair themselves. So anytime that the soil pH is not optimal, plants have a hard time taking up those nutrients. pH requirements for plants varies greatly. For turf grasses, our pH needs to be somewhere between 5.5 and 6.5. Especially across central Florida, you're going to find that your soils, which are sandy sugar sands, don't hold any moisture, don't hold any nutrients, and the pH is somewhere around 7, which is neutral on the pH scale. So the pH scale runs somewhere, it runs between 0 and 14. 7 is neutral. That's actually um, distilled water is right, pure water is right at a 7. So above 7 to 14 is an alkaline or basic soil. That's where the majority of our soils are at. Unfortunately, the higher you go, especially above 7 on the pH scale, the more the nutrients are tied up and not available to the plants. So we like to be somewhere between 5.5 and 6.5 on the pH scale, which means in our fertilizer regime, we probably need to lower our pH, but the only way you know this for sure is to have a soil test. And we can help you at the Extension Office. University of Florida does soil testing. Um, you send a sample up to Gainesville, they send you back basic information about the nutrients and about the pH as well. So this is very helpful in developing um, a, a fertilizer regime. So back to St. Augustine grass then, a little diversion to talk pH because it's really, that's an important part here. Luckily, St. Augustine grass is pretty tolerant of, of a 7 to a 7.5, so not nearly as much of an issue with this turf grass as others to take up nutrients. It's really going to establish itself quickly from sod, which is really, really nice. Usually, if you do things right within 30 days, you can get your sod established. Good salt tolerance if you find yourself over on the Gulf and you get a little bit of salt spray, but also if you are using a lot of reclaimed water, which does have more salts in it, we're not seeing really at this point in time any real impact um, on St. Augustine grass or any of the turf grasses when we irrigate because we get those good rains frequently that helps to flush through the salts. Now, really important concept here this idea of shade tolerance. St. Augustine grass has what I call good shade tolerance, not great. None of our warm season grasses are shade tolerant, but in comparison to something like Bahia grass or Bermuda grass, St. Augustine grass can fare better. So I would say it has good, in quotation marks, shade tolerance. Now, our warm season grasses, including St. Augustine grass, need full sun, at least eight hours a day of full sun, bright, hot sun, to do well, to be optimized. Remember, this is how they make food, is taking in sun. So the more food they can make, theoretically, the healthier they can be and more resilient. So the more shade you have, the less food they're making, and they're also then going to suffer a bit more. But St. Augustine grass can tolerate up to about 30% shade, but it has to be dappled. It can't be full shade. 
um, where you have a very thick canopy. And this is why in some cases if you have large trees shading the majority of your lawn, you might be having some issues with vigor or not able to get a very good thick lawn. Some really careful pruning, working with an arborist to come in and open up that canopy a little bit um, can help to get more sunlight down to St. Augustine grass. Okay, so let's move over here to disadvantages then. It's not, St. Augustine grass is not so good with cold. Luckily, we don't tend to get a lot of cold, um, not for extended periods of time in central Florida. Um, if we get down much below 30, 35 degrees and we do that for two or three days in a row, we're probably going to have a little bit of damage, maybe some, some dead areas in our St. Augustine grass. Um, but it's typically not a big issue because St. Augustine grass will go what we call quiescent. That doesn't mean it's completely dormant like Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass goes completely brown as soon as the day length drops in the fall, and it does this to protect itself. The, the roots, the crown of the plant is still alive, but it is not able to take in enough nutrients because of the going into the fall and the reduced day length. So it might as well, just like our deciduous trees drop their leaves, it might as well say, okay, I'm gonna shed this uppermost tissue and I'm just gonna go to sleep. St. Augustine grass doesn't go completely to sleep in our area. It just goes quiet. It's just sitting there. It's not heavily active, but it's not completely asleep. And this helps to protect it. This is also why you'll notice that it does tend to grow a lot slower throughout the winter months, but typically stay green. Other disadvantages, it does not do well with drought. Um, and this is why throughout our Typical dry season, supplemental irrigation is generally necessary every week, and we'll talk more about it soon. Um, but it does not do well with drought. It can be killed um, compared to something like Bahia grass that we'll talk about in just a second that has very, very good drought tolerance. It's not great with wear tolerance either. This is very much a lawn that you kind of need to stay off of. It doesn't like a lot of wear and tear. It doesn't like um, being mowed in the same directions. Um, it does not like to um, be played on. This is not a sports turf, not a turf that you want the kids or the pets to be rolling around in and, and playing sports. This is very much just a ground covering, basically. It does form also what we call thatch, and I'm going to show you and talk about thatch a little bit later on, so hold on to that concept but it does affect the health of this plant. So it does form excessive amounts of thatch. It is susceptible to chinch bug infestation as well as take all root rot. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but chinch bugs tend to start out, um, especially when it's hot and when it's dry. Um, and that first picture you'll notice right there along the sidewalk, you'll see that area that's kind of been killed out. Um, this is kind of where you'll notice them first um, starting to destroy the turf and you'll get these dead areas. They like hot, they like dry, and they'll start against the house or against the pavement or sidewalk. Take all root rot, let me, let me say this about take all root rot, it is a fungal infection. Take all root rot is ubiquitous, it is always in the soil. Generally it's not causing a problem. If we are maintaining our irrigation and fertilization regimes properly, and we have tough, resilient St. Augustine grass, take all root rot is generally not going to be a problem. It is not going to be um, capable of doing a lot of damage to our turf grass, and you'd probably never know that it is there, that it's an issue. But when that turf grass is suffering, and generally that's from being over fertilized and over watered, not under fertilized or under watered, but when we're doing too much to this grass, that's when take all root rot tends to rear its ugly head. And it's given that name because when it sits in, it can take the whole lawn very, very quickly. So a few of the cultivars um, that you're probably familiar with, certainly Floritam. I have a lot of people that will tell me they have Floritam, but not St. Augustine grass. So Floritam is a cultivar of St. Augustine grass. It is the most widely used. Um, 
It's it's the most popular because it does the best and it looks the best overall. It's very coarse texture, very deep green, very resilient. It can take a lot of punishment compared to some of the other cultivars, but it does not do well with shade and it does not do well with cold. Now, there are some others that are on the market, um, like Bitter Blue, Palmetto, Harmony, Seville, Del Mar. There are a variety of these that um, pop up from time to time, new cultivars. Telling the difference between them is pretty darn hard. Um, you might see some differences in the width of the blade very slightly, um, or how long the above ground runners um, or stolons, um, the, the internodal distance between the growing points might be a little shorter for some of these or a little longer. But in terms of you bringing it into our office and asking us which cultivar, we're probably not going to know. But if you're buying um, from a reputable sod dealer, they probably, they should know what cultivar it is, but 95% of the time it's going to be Floritam. So you might though see something like Palmetto being sold as shade tolerant. Again, there is good shade tolerance across St. Augustine grass, but it still needs upwards of eight hours of full sunlight during the day to do well. Palmetto does better with more sunlight, but it can tolerate less than Floritam. And when I say less, maybe an hour or two less. St. Augustine grass can get away with six, seven hours of full sun and do pretty well and look good for most all homeowners. You get down five and a half to six hours of full sun is where Palmetto is, is going to be good. It's going to do well. But it's no more shade tolerant, really, than Floritam. It can just take a little less during the day. Um, so not necessarily a shade-loving plant, as some people tend to um, assume. So let's talk a little bit about Bahia grass. Bahia grass, really excellent ability to survive drought. I mean, basically, you can get a little bit of a dew on um, Bahia grass that's gone dormant and kind of browned up, and it's going to start to turn green very, very quickly overnight. Um, so it does resume green growth when it's watered, when it's irrigated, or when it gets rainfall, which is really nice. Very low fertility requirements. We're lucky but that Bahia grass likes our environment. Our environment, sugar sands, maybe one, one and a half percent organic matter. So very little opportunity to catch and hold nutrients and water in our soils. Bahia grass thrives in those kinds of conditions. It does very well. So it does good in a, a low fertility situation. You can almost set it and forget it um, in terms of adding fertilizer to this plant. Now, adding a little bit of fertilizer during the growing season is good for it. It doesn't harm it in any way as long as we're not over fertilizing. And we'll talk specifics in just a minute. Um, but it does really, really well. This is a good utilitarian turf. Um, low maintenance. It is the most low maintenance of all of our turf grasses for sure. Very tolerant of sandy poor soils, which we have plenty. Um, and you can establish it from seed or sod, which is nice. Now sod, obviously, much, much quicker. Um, establishing from seed is pretty slow. Um, and this does give opportunity for um, runoff and loss of seed if we get heavy rains. Um, also, um, you can have more weed issues. Um, with uh, trying to establish by seed. But it is possible, especially over large areas. It's, it's very good and it's a very inexpensive method of establishing. Disadvantages. So overall, it's not horrible, to tell you the truth. This is still an all-around great turf. It does produce an abundance of seed heads in the summer, and it does that very quickly. You can see those in that center picture. The problem with those seed heads is it's very coarse and it does a number on our mowers. So we have a little bit higher maintenance in terms of sharpening blades to, to keep them good and sharp. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about mowing a little bit later on. But it does require a little bit more maintenance on equipment. This is a bunch type grass, meaning it grows almost straight up compared to St. Augustine grass, which grows across the surface. So St. Augustine grass runs with these stolons, and you can see them long, 
stems with growing points of little tufts of grass that establish themselves from one section to the next. The hair grass grows straight up. It does not run. It does not have these stolons, and it does not have rhizomes underground. So it grows straight up, meaning next to the plant, you can have a little bit of area where sunlight can hit the soil. And anytime sunlight can hit the soil, there's a seed bank of weeds all under that soil. So sunlight hitting soil, you're going to get weeds. So it does encourage some weed competition. Again, if you're taking good care of this grass and it's good and resilient and overall pretty pretty good coverage, you're going to have less weeds, but a few more than you'd see in other grasses. It is susceptible to mole crickets, and you can see that critter down in that bottom picture. Mole crickets um, tunnel throughout this grass primarily. As they tunnel, they will till the soil. They'll cause the roots to be exposed, and they'll dry out very quickly. Um, and they may also munch um, at the base of that plant, and, and that's not good, obviously. Typically, it's not a huge issue, to be quite honest with you, um, in most parts of, of our area, but sporadically, we will have some issues with mole crickets. Um, the hay grass is not very well wear tolerant either. Again, this is a utilitarian turf. This is not a sports turf. It's not designed to be rolled on um, extensively or, or played on extensively. Um, but overall, this is a fantastic low maintenance turf grass option for us. In terms of cultivars, now um, an important point here that I do want to make, um, you have Argentine, Pensacola, on occasion you might find something, some seed labeled as common bahia grass. It's not um, often that I see that. But Argentine and Pensacola you will find very frequently. These are the two main cultivars, but there's some big differences between them. You can look at the, the picture here of the turf grasses growing next to each other, and you can see that the Pensacola is much more thin blade grass compared to Argentine. There are a handful of other differences, but this is important because one of these is better as a turf grass compared to the other. Uh, Bahia grass is an excellent um, grazing uh, pasture grass for livestock. Pensacola is excellent for livestock, but not for lawns. So if you have a choice between the two and you're seeding or sodding, Argentine is what you want to utilize. That wider blade will shade out a lot of the soil and have much less issue with weeds. So go with Argentine and not Pensacola when you are purchasing bahia grass. All right, let's dive into discussions about some particular topics that we've already mentioned. And that's these are those ifs. So the first one is irrigation. So the best thing you can do is let the blades, the grass blades, do the talking. Now, bahia grass especially will wilt down pretty quickly, turn brown. Um, wilt, meaning it just kind of sinks in on itself and, and drops over, um, and most everybody is familiar with, with wilt here. Um, but again, with bahia grass, as soon as it gets even a small amount of moisture on it, it's going to spring back to life and green up very quickly. That doesn't mean that's something that we necessarily want to happen time and time again, because it could reduce the resiliency of this turf to outcompete with a lot of the weeds that do really well in droughty conditions. But you don't need to be irrigating something like bahia grass every single day or even every week necessarily because it is quite resilient and can bounce back. If you're over irrigating, and I'll give you specifics in just a second, you're going to encourage diseases, pests, and weeds. And you're going to reduce the resiliency of these turf grasses. So. With bahia grass, when you start to see it wilting and beginning to turn brown, that's the indication it needs supplemental irrigation if you're not getting good, consistent rainfall. Just because a week or two have gone by and you feel like maybe I need to irrigate it doesn't mean it needs it. We want to be, when we irrigate, irrigating deep but infrequently. We know from scientific research that if we are frequently irrigating, especially with light doses of irrigation, we encourage shallow rooting. 
shallow roots does not give you resilient turf. As soon as conditions get harsh, your irrigation system goes down. You go through an extended drought. It gets ex extremely hot or even extremely cold throughout the winter. Those roots are not going to be able to sustain the plant. That's where it stores food and nutrients to get itself through the turf tough times. So to build resilient turf, we want to be uh, irrigating deep but infrequently, okay? So we want those roots growing down in a, a long, extensive root system. So um, uh, with St. Augustine grass, St. Augustine grass will very quickly start to show irrigation um, deficiencies and wilt. You can see this especially late in the afternoons throughout the summer. Um, St. Augustine grass will turn blue, almost gray, maybe even a slight purple when it's seriously hot. As you walk across it, it will start to leave footprints. Now, what I want you to understand is that does not necessarily mean that you need to run out and irrigate St. Augustine grass when you see this occurring. If you're irrigating properly, you may just get heat wilt late in the afternoon You'll see some of this off color, maybe some footprints. Come back out, don't irrigate right away. Come back out the next morning and look at those leaf blades and see if they have kind of sprung back to life, if they've restored themselves overnight. If they have, that is a very indi good indication you were just dealing with heat wilt. That doesn't mean that you're really approaching the point of permanent wilting where the plant could die. This will help, again, to establish resiliency in that turf grass. If overnight, as it got cooler, it's kind of reestablished itself, excellent. Don't come in with supplemental irrigation at that point. But if you come out the next morning and it's still wilted, then that tells you, okay, I need to come in with supplemental irrigation. If you get to the point that the leaves have curled up on themselves vertically with St. Augustine grass, this is another very good indication that it may be in heat wilt um, or maybe severe drought stress. You have to really give it some time, uh, a few hours overnight, to see if it's going to rebound or not. And that's a very good indication. So looking at the, the color change, footprinting where the leaves just don't spring back, and if those leaves curl up. So let me answer a couple of questions here. That bottom picture down there is where um, bahia grass has gone completely and utterly dormant. Um, you can water back onto this and it's going to spring back to life very quickly. Um, no watering down there, okay? Now if that was St. Augustine grass, that'd be dead if it was at that point, okay? And you're looking at completely rejuvenating that lawn and redoing it. Um, uh, morning or evening watering. So specifically here, Ray, we do have watering restrictions, and some of you may be from other counties, I'm not sure, so watering restrictions can vary. You can check with your utilities. In Pasco County specifically, we cannot water throughout the day, and nobody should be, um, because you're going to get a lot more evaporation and very little of that water actually getting to the root zone. It's just going to evaporate, so it's spending a lot of money, wasting a lot of water at the same time. So. Depending on how many zones you've got for irrigation, it could affect how long it takes you to, to irrigate. But basically what I always suggest is if you can begin irrigating very early in the morning compared to evening, it's best because the moisture will burn off in the morning off the leaf blades and this can help to prevent a lot of disease. Compared to irrigating late at night, um, if you're irrigating late at night, you're leaving more moisture on the leaf blade, a little bit higher chance of disease, but overall, either one is okay um, to go with. Just definitely avoid during the day. Pasco County, we can irrigate after 6 p.m. to 8 a.m., depending on which day, um, based on your address, that you can water. We do have water restrictions, so one day a week, in most cases, um, unless you're using micro irrigation or hand watering, one day a week, otherwise up to two days a week. 
that you could water um, in, in Pasco County. So I have a lot of people that go, oh my gosh, one day a week is all that I could I could possibly irrigate if my turf needs it. But if you've built resilient turf, keeping these ifs in mind, you can help it get through um, so that one week irrigation is, is perfectly okay. And I'm, I'll give a little bit more specific about that a little bit later on, Ray. So very good question. So, um, with irrigation, like I said, the majority of turf grass problems I see are not from underwatering, they're from overwatering. What we're looking for, and again, this is based on University of Florida research, we're looking for somewhere between a half inch, probably closer to three quarters is what I usually tell folks, but three quarters of an inch of water per application of irrigation. That's really all it needs. If it's resilient turf, to get through that particular week, okay? Now, um, this does mean that you have to calibrate your system frequently and check for problems. So you have to check for broken heads, you have to check for heads that are not aimed in the right direction, you especially don't want them irrigating your road or your driveway or the side of your house. You wanna make sure they're aimed um, specifically into the turf grass, not into the landscape beds. Um, because um, what the landscape needs and what the turf needs are two very different things. Landscape plants that are established and doing well don't need supplemental irrigation. That goes for our trees as well. That's different compared to our turf grass, especially San Augustine grass. So you do have to check for problems and you do have to calibrate. Now calibration is not difficult whatsoever. A lot of times I'll get folks that send me pictures or call me or bring me samples of turf and want to know what the issue is. And one of the first questions I ask is how much water are you applying when you irrigate? Most people say 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And I'll say, no, how much water are you putting down? Uh, 20 minutes. So the amount of time doesn't matter. It's the amount of water. So we need three fourths of an inch of water per irrigation event. That means I've got to calibrate my system. Three quarters of an inch with my system might mean I have to spray 30 minutes. Um, um, if in other cases, depending on my head and my irrigation system and the pressure, it might mean 10 minutes to get three quarters of an irrigation, uh, three quarters of an inch of irrigation. So we can certainly help you with your irrigation system. And yes, uh, Frank, we absolutely can help. We do have some tutorials and we're happy to walk you through and to have some excellent fact sheets. You can always email us or call us and we can help you with irrigation. It is not difficult, I promise you. Most people go, uh-oh, math. It is not that difficult. You see here in the middle picture, somebody has a couple of um, tuna fish cans or cat food cans um, and a, a ruler. And that's really just as hard as it is. You run that irrigation system for 10 minutes. You have these cans placed throughout. Um, your particular zone and you measure how much water in that 10 minutes and you either water more to get three quarters of an inch or less. And you need to do this for each zone because each zone you might be putting out a little bit more, a little bit less. So again, first thing is to check all those heads, make sure they're operating properly. And you got to do this frequently. With, with calibration, I like to tell folks you get your teeth cleaned twice a year. Um, so whenever you get your teeth cleaned, go ahead and calibrate your irrigation system. It's important, especially if you have extended periods of time where you have loss of electricity, um, especially after hurricanes, we usually see a lot of issues here where um, systems need to be recalibrated, the time clocks need to be reset, and we can help you with that as well. A lot of folks are irrigating two, three, four, five times a week, and they don't realize that. Um, because of the settings in their time clock. So we certainly can help you. We specialize in helping folks with irrigation issues. So just give us a call and we'll get you to the right person. Um, one thing I would suggest is make sure you do not mix um, sprinkler head types. So if you've got those low impact um, mist type sprayers in the same zone with a big rotary or impact head sprayer, they're gonna put out very different amounts of water. So um, the small, surprisingly, the little mist sprayers, the little rotor sprayers can put out up to two inches an hour. 
compared to the big impact heads that are turning around, those can put out maybe a half inch to an inch an hour. So if you've got those mixed in a zone, you may have one part that's getting two or three inches of irrigation and another getting maybe a half inch, okay? New sod, um, so Ray, new sod, new sod um, establishment looks a little bit different from an irrigation standpoint. Again, we can help you with this specifically. New sod, 30 day, um, you wanna come in with a 30 day irrigation regime where you're giving blasts, many different blasts for a few minutes throughout the day and then you slowly wean off of those blasts to get you to where you're only irrigating once or twice a week, somewhere around 30 days in. So we certainly can help you with a, a new sod establishment um, irrigation plan, and you're okay within watering restrictions for that 30 days to be irrigating more frequently. Um, also there with new sod establishment, I would highly recommend that you don't try to put down new sod until we are right on top of or into our raining season, which is usually around June. Um, you know, if you're putting down new sod in December, January, February, it's cold, it's struggling, um, and it's also incredibly dry. So it's going to have a really, really hard time getting established through those periods. And plus, it's mainly quiescent. It's kind of asleep during those periods of time. So be aimed at um, our, our typical warm season. Um, I'll be overseeing lawn with Argentine Bahia, how much watering? So again, Sam, we can certainly help you with specifics on that. You would want to be, um, when you're establishing from seed, it looks very similar, your irrigation practices to establishing with sod, giving some bursts throughout the day. So give us, give us a call and we can help you specifically with that. I can tell you exactly what you need to be doing. Um, so again, avoid light, frequent irrigation. Um, we want deep, infrequent. We're building resiliency here. We don't want it to basically expect getting irrigation every day. The roots just stay too shallow. We want that turf grass to, in its tiny non-existent brain, to basically say, I don't know when I'm getting any more water, I better take care of myself. Um, don't irrigate your landscaping and your turf on the same zone. Again, you may be wasting a lot of water here over irrigating your landscape plants and causing disease and pest problems on those. Make sure you know how to use that control box. I deal with some folks that honestly don't even know where the control box is at for their irrigation system. Don't feel bad if that's the case. Um, you know, when we buy a house or we have a system installed, most folks don't know how to use that or where it's located. Call us and let us help you walk through setting it properly and understanding how to use it. This is where most people go wrong, is they are irrigating way too much, thinking they're at one day a week when they're not because of how the zones are set up. And they've got too many programs in their controller instead of just one program. So the bottom picture, very good question here, Jordan, relates to the use of having either a soil moisture sensor, which is placed below ground, so moisture sensors are very good, very accurate, as long as they're installed properly. And again, we can help you with this. There's right ways and wrong ways. But a soil moisture sensor basically tells your irrigation system, hey, there's enough moisture in the soil and the root zone. No need to irrigate, and it shuts off your irrigation system. Whenever that critical moisture point drops too low, though, it can trigger the system to come on at the right time. Compared to that photo, that's an irrigation shutoff device. If you are working, have an irrigation system, by law, you must have an irrigation shutoff device installed and properly working. And you can pick these up for about $20 um, from any of the big box stores. Honestly, they don't last more than two years, typically. The little cap that you see there at the top, the little white cap, under there are a series of cork discs. And what happens as it rains, those little corks fill up. And as they fill up, they expand and they trigger, because this is attached to your irrigation system, they trigger the system to go, oh, it rained, shut off, don't irrigate. So this is a good way to prevent over irrigating. Um, and this is a good way not to be wasting water. Now, 
Um, the issue with this is it must be um, uh, installed where it's out from under the eave of the house, where you do not have um, uh, trees overhanging, and don't put it over top of your um, air conditioning unit because this is all going to affect how much rainfall is actually getting into that little cap. And so it's not completely foolproof, but this is the cheapest and best way to control your irrigation system. How do you know if you have one? So, um, Jordan, go out, look around the eaves of your house. You should see this little device. They all look pretty much the same, sticking out somewhere from under the eave of the house if you have an irrigation system. If you don't, you can um, work with an irrigation company to come out and install these very quickly and easily. Now, some folks can definitely do this themselves. If you're quite handy and you understand how to wire something up, you can, you can do this quite easily. You can see the wire leading toward the house there at the bottom of this picture. Other folks prefer to have somebody come out. Um, is there a way to verify it's working properly? Very good question. So basically, you can test the system. You can calibrate it. You can go out there on a nice sunny day when there's no rain expected. Um, and you can have your uh, start your irrigation system. Just do a test, start your irrigation system, and dump some water over top of that little cap. And after a few minutes, it should fill up and trigger that system to shut off. If it does not shut off, that tells you it probably needs to be replaced or it's not hooked up properly. So very good questions there, Jamie. All right, so let's move on here to talk fertilizer, okay? So just like with irrigation, this is another one of those ifs, if this, if that. Um, does over-irrigation contribute to fungus? Yes, absolutely. How do I get rid of fungus in St. Augustine grass? Okay, Richard, it really does depend on what kind of fungus you're dealing with. First of all, we have to identify. A lot of people think they have a fungal problem, and they don't. Um, but sometimes it does exist, and it might not even be causing disease, to be honest. So the best thing that you can do is um, you can call us, and we can walk through, ask you some particular questions to determine if we do think you have an issue. We can also take submissions right now with the current um, stay-at-home orders and whatnot. We will be opening up our office very soon. You can bring in um, a... A, a, maybe um, a square foot of turf grass. I don't need a lot of soil, but we do need some roots. So you just go out and about the size of a piece of notebook paper. You'll remove that, bring that into us. We can, in most all cases, identify it on site. We may, though, ask you, or if you didn't want to go through that process, you can, and I'll have information to use the plant disease clinic. At the end of this presentation, you can submit a sample up to Gainesville. There's a particular way to do this. There are online instructions and an online form. There is a $40 charge, but you can send it up to Gainesville to the plant disease clinic on campus, and they can test it and after a few days be able to give you a definitive um, if it's there and what it is. So a couple of different options there. Um, there are, in some cases, some depending on the grass and depending on if the, the fungal pathogen, there may or may not be um, chemical controls, um, fungicides available. It varies. They are more preventative. Um, if you are resodding, I suggest that folks use one, maybe two applications of fungicide, very particular types. And again, we can have these discussions more specifically individually with you. Um, but I suggest you put down a preventative application, one or two of those, because it goes through transplant shock to help prevent fungal problems. Typically, though, this is not necessary if you have resilient turf. If you're managing the irrigation and the fertilizer, you have very little issues with fungus. So this is not usually the first problem we see in turf. We typically see overwatering, first of all, just killing the grass. Um, for a variety of reasons. Second major problem I usually see are insect issues. Third, and least common, are disease issues. So again, let's talk fertilization here. So like we said earlier, um, fertilizer is not food. It's not plant food. Fertilizer is the basis, the nutrient base, to build 
the cells of the plant. These are living things just like us and they need nutrients to build, repair themselves, to reproduce themselves over time. A lot of folks, you know, are a little bit confused on how much fertilizer to use. Again, a soil test, um, and you can contact our office. We can send you um, information about how to do a soil test. There's a $10 charge to the University of Florida. This comes back with basic pH and basic nutrient requirements as well as a recommendation. We can help you walk through those recommendations as well if you just call us back when you get your results. But Depending on your maintenance level and a little bit depending on the turf grass species, you need somewhere between two to four pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet annually. No more, okay? Now, two pounds of nitrogen, much lower maintenance. You're gonna be um, mowing it less frequently because it's not gonna grow as much and as fast. You're going to have less disease problems, you're going to have less pest problems, and you're going to have less likelihood that you're going to cause runoff and leaching into our waterways, leading to pollution from nitrogen. This is where we get those algal blooms that are so damaging across our state and our waterways. So anything we can do to reduce the amount of nitrogen fertilizer going into the waterways, we need to. Phosphorus is also in our fertilizer and this is another major contributor to water pollution so i'll talk just a little bit more specifics about those in a second um, but four pounds if you're putting down four pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet annually you're going to be mowing more often and you're going to have a higher risk slight but a higher risk of issues um, with disease and pest issue uh, potential problems okay so somewhere in between bahia grass, low maintenance, if you just want it to look nice, two pounds per year of nitrogen is all you need. St. Augustine grass needs a little bit more, maybe three pounds, four pounds maximum. What we find is most people are heavily, heavily fertilizing. The great majority of that is running off or being leached. It's not being used by the plant. So you are wasting your time, you're wasting your money, and you're probably driving yourself a little bit crazy. So that was why the title of this talk was Saving Yourself Time, Money, and Your Sanity. Um, fertilizer and irrigation are the two main issues where people will waste um, a lot of money and a lot of time and cause themselves a lot more problems down the road. Um, so algal blooms, so this is where um, we get um, uh, heard of them in the ocean? Yes, you can have algal blooms in the ocean. You can also have these in fresh water. So um, these can, in some cases, not always, but produce toxins. These are living um, um, uh, bacterial-like organisms that some species release toxins that can cause fish kills, um, can lead to the loss of beneficial aquatic organisms, and um, can produce toxins that can harm us as well, potentially. So these do lead sometimes to dead zones. Um, algal blooms are more of an issue in our fresh waters, lakes, streams, springs, creeks, rivers, compared to um, some of the dinoflagellates um, that are more of an issue out along the coast and in our marine waters that can also produce um, some toxins that are dangerous to us, us and marine life. So um, two different issues really there, but they do um, play in together in some cases. So nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, these are the big three. You will see um, right there on your um, fertilizer label, N is always number one, P is in number two position, and K, potassium, is in the number three position. Always the case. Um, Again, nitrogen and phosphorus are major pollutants, so there are um, state laws on how much of these can be used a year, and I'm going to discuss that in just a few minutes. Um, we are lucky in that potassium, <laughs> in this case you see potassium listed as an eight here, is not a pollutant at this point in time, so we get, we get lucky with that nutrient. Now, when we say these are the big three or the major nutrients, it doesn't mean they're more important than any of the others. All plants need 16, 17 different elements to survive and build their cells and do well. Um, 
but the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium are needed in higher amounts. So that's why they're called the big three or the major three. But they're no more important than the micronutrients like sulfur, iron, iron manganese, magnesium. Um, all of those are just as important, just needed in much smaller or trace amounts. So we do know that if we're putting down too much nitrogen, it encourages pest and weed problems and diseases. Um, and it also encourages thatch. And again, I'm going to talk about thatch later on, but this is a major problem with St. Augustine grass. Now, with nitrogen, state law says that you need to be using a slow-release nitrogen product compared to a very quick-release product. Okay, quick release means you put it down and the nitrogen is either used right away or it volatilizes to the atmosphere very quickly and you lose a lot of money this way and there's a lot of potential to burn your turf. These are salts. So you can burn the plants and kill them very quickly. Um, this is applicable if you needed kind of a quick rescue, if you were to do a nutrient test, a soil test, and it came back and said, whoa, you're very deficient in nitrogen, you need a quick boost, these are, these are beneficial in that regard. A little bit cheaper compared to a coated product, like a sulfur or polymer coated urea, that's a slow release fertilizer. That means that the fertilizer, the nutrient, is coated by um, some sort of coating, there are a variety of them, that breaks down very slowly over time, and it releases small meter doses to the plant. It makes a lot more sense, because the plant can't use everything that you throw at it quickly with a fast release, a quick release product. It either can take it up or it can't. If it can't take it off, it either runs off across the surface or leaches down into the waterway. Again, wasting your time, wasting your money, and becoming a pollutant. If you're putting out a slow release product, you are going to slowly over time give small amounts of the fertilizer to the plant and it can use it much more efficiently. A little bit more money involved, not much, because these go through a little bit more processing. Okay, so a slow release product is much, much more beneficial to your turf grasses. And with a slow release product, you should be looking to put out between a half a pound to one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Now, I understand a lot of people are going, what is she talking about, about pounds and square feet? Again, if you reach out to us, we can work with you on an individual basis to explain how to use fertilizer properly. That's kind of another class. A lot of people are putting out way too much fertilizer. They're also putting, out, putting it out at the wrong time of the year. We do not need or want to fertilize when the plants are asleep or dormant. Why would we do that if they're asleep? They cannot take it up. We're going to waste time, we're going to waste money, and we're going to pollute. That's all that's happening during that time. So we want to be spoon feeding small amounts of slow release products throughout mid-April, that spring green up basically, maybe mid-March, but you want to try to avoid any potential for frost because you've got fresh new green tissue that's very vulnerable. You can have some winter kill this way. So I usually tell folks to wait until April when we get good spring green up. This is when you start to fertilize. And you can fertilize up to about the first to middle part of October. Um, and you can do this frequently throughout the summer is what I would suggest. Not one big fertilization. You, you don't want to put it all down at one time. If you're aiming for two pounds um, for the whole year, you need to put down that two pounds throughout that growing season that's actively growing, not late fall through the winter and early spring. So you need to only do it through that growing season when it's warm, basically, and we're getting some rain. Um, and uh, also keep in mind here, if, if, if you're planning to put out two pounds annually, you can't put that out all at one time. It's not good for the plant. It's not going to take up all of that. You're going to waste your money and pollute. 
but there are laws against this too. If it's a true slow release fertilizer, and I can describe to you personally how to tell the difference between the two, because the package doesn't really tell you everything you need here, unfortunately. But um, we can have a quick discussion and I can help you with that as long as you have your fertilizer label. Um, but you can only put out one pound maximum. You don't have to put out all of that. But you can only put out up to one pound maximum per thousand square feet if it's a true slow release product. If it's a quick release, no more than half a pound per fertilization um, application. And again, also keep in mind, most fertilizers, you definitely need to follow the label directions, but most require that you irrigate after. You need to do this immediately after fertilizing. It's okay to do so even with watering restrictions because you're only gonna put down a quarter of an inch of irrigation. If you put down more than a quarter, you're gonna flush it past the root zone and the plant can't take it up. So again, wasting your time, your money, and your pollutant, okay? Um, so a quarter of an inch is what you're looking for whenever you um, fertilize. So also don't fertilize right before a big rain or a hurricane. I hear some people say, oh, there's a storm coming through. It's a good time to fertilize. No, 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 no. Because if you get this inundation of water, you're just going to push it through your root zone and pollute. Okay? So again, I highly suggest that you have a soil test done. This is really the only way for you to know what fertilizer you need and then how much and what concentration. And we can certainly help with that. It's quick, it's simple, and it's cheap. And it will save you a lot of time and money. But let's talk shade. So this is a big one. So I referred to the issue of shade um, a, a, a little bit ago. So most all of our warm season grasses have very, very poor shade tolerance. Somewhere between six and eight hours of full sun, middle of the day, the hot stuff is necessary. Bahia grass, Bermuda grass needs eight hours minimum, 10 is best. Okay, so you're only going to be getting that through the summer. This is why it's dormant or it's asleep or not really growing and quiescent through the winter. It's just not enough sunlight. St. Augustine grass can tolerate less. It's not tolerant of shade, but less than our other turf grasses. Somewhere around six hours of full sun, most of our St. Augustine grasses will do very well. It actually likes a little bit of filtered shade. And this diagram is nice. You can see here what we mean by part sun, part shade. So part sun is a little bit, just a tiny amount of shade here or there with small plants. It's probably going to be okay. Part shade, it's dappled, dappled, and I mean, that's very little shade, okay? That's about 30% shade there. Again, St. Augustine grass is going to make it and probably be good and be okay, but if you get up full shade and dense shade, you're not going to grow turf grass. So people will sometimes ask me, you know, how can I get turf grass to grow under my tree? And there's basically one answer. It's a one-cut prune. You take down the tree. It's either the tree or the turf. Um, I know folks don't like that, um, that particular answer, but that's the reality. So what do you do? If you've got a tree that you can't remove, that you don't want to remove, if it's too costly, um, or something you can't get approved through an HOA or something like that, you simply use shade-loving plants um, instead of turf grass under that tree. And again, we can help you make those determinations of which plants like shade and which ones like sun. Because our first principle of Florida-friendly landscaping is to put the right plant in the right place. If I try to grow a sun-loving plant like Bahia grass or St. Augustine grass in shade, it's the wrong plant in the wrong place. It's going to suffer. And the first thing folks want to do when plants are suffering is add more water. That's not going to help that situation. It's going to make it worse. The second thing, they go, well, that didn't help. Maybe it needs fertilizer. So they go put fertilizer on it. The worst thing you can do to a suffering plant is say grow. And that's what I do when I put fertilizer on it. I give it nutrients. The third thing folks will try to do in these cases is, well, there must be a disease. There must be a pest. They've not identified one, but maybe that's the cause of why this plant is suffering. So they'll put pesticides out. Again, wasting time wasting money, and they're polluting if they're putting these out for no good reason. 
So if you put the right plant in the right place, optimally over time, it should be happy and not need any of these supplements. Okay? So it's a little bit of my soapbox there. I'm sorry for that. But we do know that plants that are happy where they're at, especially our turf grasses, um, will do very, very well over time. But full sun is, is really essential. And, you know, full sun does not mean 9 to 10 a.m. It does not mean 5 to 6 p.m. or 4 to 5. It means all day, the heat of the day. We want all of it. Plants are greedy, especially turf grass. The more sunlight they have, the more they want. Um, if you do have some light shade, do have some light shade with your St. Augustine grass, please keep in mind it's going to require less water, it's going to require less fertilizer, but it's also going to only take less traffic than normal too. It's not going to be exceptionally happy. So you don't want to overwater it, you don't want to be adding more fertilizer, so maybe cut everything in half and see how the plants do. Um, compared to if they were in full sun, and stay off of it. Don't definitely don't be walking on it, even you know from the door to the the car. Really stay off of it because it's struggling. Um, if it's getting less than than that full sun um, hours that it needs a day, it's going to suffer. Um, but maybe again consider with an arborist some thoughtful pruning of the canopy of a tree to open it up just a little bit more. Um, and please work with an arborist to make sure this is safe and it's and it's okay for, for the tree as well. And again, shade-loving plants, use some mulch under there. There's a variety of alternatives. Turf grass is not always the answer, especially when it comes to shade. All right, so this is a really nice diagram that I absolutely love here that shows at the very bottom you see 8 to 10 hours of full sun, 8 hours, 6 to 8, 5 hours. So take a look there at Bermuda grass. Bermuda grass needs 10 hours of full sun. That's where it's happy. At eight hours, it'll get by, but it's not incredibly happy. So where it's not incredibly happy, it's gonna struggle a little bit. This is where it needs less water and it needs less um, fertilizer, but it also doesn't want to be bothered as much. Moving down, Bahia grass does very well with eight hours of full sun. Bright, open, sunny spots, perfect for it. It absolutely loves it. Moving on down the line, you see St. Augustine grass, that common floor tam, six to eight hours. Prefers eight hours, can take a little bit of part, part sun, a little bit of dappled, it can do quite well. Six hours, it will do fine, it will do well, but it's not gonna be quite as happy. It's not gonna be quite as resilient. Definitely less water, less fertilizer down there. If you note some of the dwarf St. Augustines, like Captiva, Seville, you may have heard of a few of those. Even Palmetto, it's not a dwarf, but it's down in this. It can tolerate five hours. Tolerate it. Not happy, not really thick and dense and lush, but it can tolerate it, okay? Um, but again, definitely not shade-loving plants. Okay, let's talk about thatch. I've, ma I've mentioned this term several times. If we are over watering, if we are over irrigate, uh, or over fertilizing, we're going to have some major problems with thatch, especially in St. Augustine grass. This is not an issue with Bahia grass because Bahia grass um, doesn't grow um, in this this particular form. Okay, so. It's upright, no stolons running across the surface of the ground. Now, a lot of folks are confused and think that thatch buildup is um, um, turf grass clippings. That's not the case. Turf grass clippings are perfectly fine to leave on your lawn. They decompose very, very quickly because we've got a lot of microorganisms, usually a lot of moisture and warmth. They decompose quick actually is a very good supplement with nitrogen. So if you are leaving your clippings on your lawn in central Florida, that's pretty much the equivalent of one nitrogen fertilization in the summer, okay? So you can cut back just slightly on your fertilization that way. Now, thatch is an accumulation then of old stolons. So if you remember I said these long, stems of turf grass and everybody's seen them kind of running that St. Augustine grass running across the surface 
where you have individual little plants that produce roots along that stem. They're growing points called nodes all along that stem. So this is how it likes to move itself around. Now as you get dense turf, especially when we're fertilizing and irrigating a lot, the denser and tighter that gets, some of those stolons get old and they die. As they get old and die, they're pretty thick, pretty tough, and those don't decompose very quickly. And you'll start to get an accumulation of those in some form of decomposition that forms thatch. So thatch is made up of dead stolons. Um, it is not made up of, uh, of um, uh, turf grass clippings, okay? And so the stolons are great and wonderful to have. They're good runners out across there and can help your turf spread into areas where maybe you've had some issues in the past. Um, so they're good. Don't go out and remove those, but you may over time have to remove major accumulations of those that I'll talk about in a minute. It usually takes a few years for this to build up. This photo, you can see the roots, the lighter whitish yellowish roots at the bottom of this piece of sod here. You can see the grass blades, the green blades at the top, and then you see this darker line right in the middle. That's thatch. And you can do kind of a soil profile trim, cut down with a spade, pull back, and you can see that thatch layer. The thicker it is, um, the more problems you're going to have. Thatch does not allow oxygen to get to the roots. Roots need oxygen. It does not allow for good penetration of water and irrigation to the roots. It does not allow for fertilizer to get to the roots. And, and if you are putting out pesticides that are, when they're necessary, it may not allow them to be taken up and used by the plant properly as well. And yes, um, Ray, I'll talk about dethatching in just a second. Certainly necessary at some point um, in St. Augustine grass. So thatch reduces aeration, reduces permeability, negatively affects the health of the grass. If you walk out across your St. Augustine grass and it's spongy, if you feel like you're walking on a, a, a spongy mattress, you've got a pretty hefty thatch layer, okay? If you are irrigating properly and not over fertilizing, this thatch accumulation will be slower over time. You will still get thatch because you still get stolen. So that's, that's the nature of the game here. But it won't occur as fast over time and won't take as much of a toll. But sooner or later, you do need to do some aerification, which involves verticutting or dethatching. Now, you could go out there with a heavy-duty rake and just rake the fire out of that stuff. Or you could have a company come in with a machine and do what's called verticutting. They'll use a system of blades. They'll run across that turf grass. Now, do this in the growing season when we're getting good, good rain. It's going gonna, it's gonna to do a number on your lawn. The turf grass is going to look pretty rough for a few days, even to a week. But this is normal. This is pretty common. Just do it during the active growing season when we're getting good rain. Um, and you're going to find they're going to rake up all of this debris, and it will have to be hauled away. You will be shocked as to how much thatch is coming up um, out of your lawn. Very quickly, the turf grass will go, hey, there's more room to move around, there's more aeration, more accessibility to the irrigation, and you'll start to see those stolons running across the surface very quickly, and it will recuperate, repair itself, and be much, much healthier. I can't give you a general rule of thumb on when you should do this. It might be every three or four years, um, just depending, again, on how much um, um, you've been fertilizing. So it, it does vary. The more you fertilize, the more inputs, the more frequently you'd have to do this. Not typically every year, maybe every other year at the most. Um, and again, not an issue with Bahia grass whatsoever, just because of the growth of the plants are very, very different. But this is a major contributing factor to a lot of problems in turf grasses, and this can certainly cause us to have more disease issues with take all. Um, and even probably some more issues with um, chinch bugs. So this is something we certainly want to be slowing down and controlling and removing. So mowing. Let's talk a little bit about mowing. Best practices. Make sure you keep your blades sharp. 
If you don't know how to sharpen your blades at home, you can definitely take them um, to um, some of the, the maintenance companies in the area and they will sharpen them sometimes for free for you. Companies, if you've got a route-based company, um, it's certainly accept, uh, acceptable to ask them how frequently that they are um, uh, sharpening their blades. You know, the more lawns they cut, the more frequently they need to be um, uh, sharpening their blades. This is an issue with turf grass health. If you go out and you look at the, the tips of the turf grass after you mow, if it looks jagged and ragged at that cut mark, your blades need to be sharpened. If the blades are not sharpened and you have this ragged, torn edge instead of a flushed cut, you're going to lose a lot more moisture out of the plant. You want a very clean cut, just like if you took a sharp knife across that blade. So this is going to be an overall issue for health, so make sure blades are sharpened. Keep your mowers as clean as you possibly can. Rinse them down. Um, after every mowing, this will help um, if you do have a little bit of uh, fungal issue in there, help keep you from moving it around to other location. I also suggest that you rotate your mowing direction with both of these turf grasses, but especially St. Augustine grass. If you remember, I said it's got very poor wear tolerance. It does not like to be mowed in the same direction over and over. You'll get rutting from the tires, which is not good in a variety of ways. But you want to, you can use a, a clock face and you want to mow maybe from 9 to 3, next time you mow 6 to 12, okay, and kind of rotate all the way around that clock, just thinking from a, a diameter, okay, diagonally um, across your lawn now. Um, everybody wants to try to get done as quick as they possibly can, so there are particular routes that we usually take because it's quicker and easier but if you'll change up the mowing direction your lawn will really love you for it um, again this will help with the overall health and the wear and tear will be a lot less significant on these plants avoid mowing when it's wet so this can be pretty challenging during the summer when we're getting a lot of rain if you can avoid mowing when it's really wet, if you know if it's just rain, don't mow because you're going to get some clumping, um, and that's going to contribute to some fungal issues. You want a lot of airflow as much as possible in between the leaf blades, and that will help decrease fungal issues. Um, you can utilize on both of these turf grasses a rotary mower, which is really really nice. Um, and, and cheaper um, uh, than using um, uh, other types of blades, but just make sure you have these um, uh, maintained and that you're being safe. Height is very important for our turf grass health. Mow your Bahia grass and your St. Augustine grass where it is three to four inches high. You do not want to mow below three inches because the turf grass will suffer, okay? Um, and if you're mowing it at two inches, it's going to um, really do a number on the roots. Um, think of it like this. If you've got a particular shrub and that shrub is, it's a mature height is 12 feet tall and you take it and you put it into an area where you've got some other trees maybe and it cannot get any higher than six feet and you're constantly pruning it back to keep it at six feet when it really wants to be at 12 it's not going to be happy and it's going to suffer again wrong plant wrong place with our turf grasses we can certainly have them in the right place but if we are trimming them way too low it's going to suffer so research tells us both of these grasses need to be somewhere between three and four inches high. But hay grass, I don't like for it to get much over four inches because the blades will kind of tip over and they'll, they'll kind of shade out the rest of the plant a little bit. So three to four inches is where you want to be. A rotary mower, Jordan, is where the blades go round and round um, just above the surface of the soil. Typically a, a push mower in most cases would be a rotary mower. This is in comparison to um, a mower where the blade um, uh, runs across the surface and, and is rotating 
um, as it goes uh, across the surface um, diagonally. Um, so rotary mower, very classic, has a big deck under underneath the mower, um, and the 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 mo the rotary mower is running in a clockwise fashion, the blade right across the surface um, of the turf grass. Okay, very common. This is the majority of what everybody would have. All right, so we've covered quite a bit of information here. This is kind of a primer um, when it comes to the ifs, ands, and the buts. The irrigation, the fertilization, and the shade. Very major considerations to keep in mind here in choosing which turf grass species you want to use. We talked some disadvantages and advantages. And also if turf grass is the right plant for the particular location. Right plant, right place is critical here, okay? so. Um, I refer to the fact that um, you can um, send up soil samples to the University of Florida's lab, Soils Lab in Gainesville. Also referred to the Plant Disease Clinic up in Gainesville. If you have any kind of plants, not just turf grasses, that you feel like could be diseased, we can help work with you to get those um, submissions sent up. You can also call us, talk to us about how to get submissions to us. Um, and um, we can help you work through most all of those problems very early on. And I see some questions. I will cover those just in a, a few minutes. Thank you for that. We also have right now, because we're going through pretty much an unprecedented time, we tend to have um, a, our offices. We're going to be opening again very soon. Um, we're working through some of those physical distancing guidelines to make sure we keep everybody safe. Um, but our Pasco Master Gardener volunteers, these are very highly trained, certified volunteers through the University of Florida, have um, created a virtual plant clinic. They can help you um, with all kinds of questions, not just turf related. Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock, you can jump in. You can see here the um, URL to join. All you have to do is give us a call at the Pasco County Extension Office. You see our 352-518-0156. We can send you an email with that link so you don't have to rush to write it down. Um, and we also, just this week, introduced a Tuesday, Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. for those that work during the day. Um, and there's a different link, but we can give you both of those links. There's also a special email virtualpcpasco at gmail.com where you can reach out and within a day you are going to hear back from a master gardener volunteer. If they don't feel like they can answer your questions, they will get that those questions over to me or over to our Florida Friendly Landscape and Program Manager and we can help you work through those. So we can answer questions about your turf grasses, about your trees, your shrubs, um, about fertilization, irrigation, shade, we can give you alternatives. We are happy to send you little brief fact sheets. Like if you need suggestions on shade loving plants, we have all of that information accessible to you. Just reach out to us at that number um, or send us an email and we can get you the links to join the virtual plant clinic or you can definitely get to us um, if you have questions. So let me, okay, can you speak about measuring blade height? measure from root to tip after mowing um, to know if it's three inches high. So it's, it's kind of approximate, it's a little hard, but basically if you were to take a ruler and just set it down next to the plant, the crown of the plant or the growing point is right at the surface of the soil. It's just above it, right where it's going to meet the root going down into the soil. So take a ruler, put it right down next to the crown of the plant, the base of the plant, where you have some roots coming out, and just measure to the tip of the blade right where you've cut it okay so you're measuring pretty much from the base of the crown right at the soil surface to the tip of that blade and you'll be able to tell exactly where you're at on that ruler and tells you if you need to mow a little higher or a little lower and adjust your settings let's see so david what is fescue okay it's a good question david so fescue is a cool season turf grass um, cool season turf grasses don't do too well down in our parts so this is a very common grass um, further north, especially in the more temperate areas. I am from Kentucky originally, and we had a lot of fescue up there. Um, fescue um, 
is uh, very good throughout the summer. It's very resilient up in that part of the country. Does not do well here. So not a good idea. Now somebody's probably going to say, but I can go and buy it. Just because you can buy it here doesn't mean that you should, okay? So right plant, right place also applies to climate. Um, so be very cautious here. That That is not a good turf grass for us. Now, I will say there are some cool season grasses that you can overseed in the um, late fall to get a green lawn through the winter. There are a lot of ifs, ands, or buts with overseeding. So typically folks might use um, annual ryegrass to do this. There's a little bit of a risk, to be honest with you. You don't need to do it with St. Augustine grass. You could do it with Bahia. You can definitely do it with Bermuda grass if you have Bermuda. Um, but it, there's, there's a lot of weather related aspects, especially in the winter because, or, or in the spring, because that ryegrass is, is annual, it's a cool season grass like fescue, it would burn off when we start to get hotter. And hopefully you would have this overlap to where just as your warm season grass is starting to grow again, the cool season overseeding grass is dying off. If it doesn't, if we stay cooler and wetter through the spring than usual, that that annual grass that you've overseeded with will hang around too long and crowd out, shade out, and outcompete your good grass that you want through the rest of the year, your warm season grass, and you will have dead spots. So you have to really be careful doing that. Um, most Some people will do that with Bermuda grass because it goes so, so dormant, the upper portion dies, um, and it looks, you know, you've got a brown, completely brown lawn through the year. It's not something overseeding that I would suggest for most lawn um, homeowners. But if you've got St. Augustine grass, you definitely don't need, don't need to do it. Okay, um, Sam, thank you very much. Great info. Appreciate that. Um, Jordan, has this been videoed? All right, so Jordan, let me say this. I am doing my best to make sure this gets captured on video. Um, sometimes, the, it's, I will say it's not foolproof. So I'm doing my best to get this captured. Um, it usually takes a few days for it to render. I then go back in um, to the to the system. I look through closed captioning. So any of you that need closed captioning, um, we do um, also. Um, we can certainly accommodate for that. Um, I, I work to get those links up as quick as I can on our Pasco County website. So I will. Uh, my intention is to video it and have this available for you on demand as well, but it'd probably take me a few days, just to be honest with you. Um, let's see, uh, Delilah, we have a lot of thatch. Could it be because the builder didn't put enough soil? I can see sand under the grass. Not necessarily. Um, that's a very good question. Um, you know, a lot of times when we get fill, um, dirt in, you can have some issues with that. Number one main concern is compaction. Um, we get a lot of compaction around the construction of homes and the fill dirt that comes in, the depth is not typically an issue, it's the content. The content is usually shale um, um, and it's um, all calcium. And calcium is very high pH. So we will tend to have some major pH problems. Now pH you cannot permanently change, only temporarily with um, using um, acidifying fertilizers. But I, I don't think that, that you have much of an issue with the um, layer of, of soil underneath there. If you're seeing sand, that's okay um, compared to something like shale, um, which is made up of shells basically. This was wonderful. Thank you, Laura. Um, might there be an upcoming webinar about common weeds? We will probably work on that, Laura. Um, common weeds, especially in your turf grasses, um, can definitely be an issue. Most folks um, approach controlling them in the wrong fashion, to be honest. So the best time to control your weeds is in the uh, fall. Put down a pre-emergent herbicide, pre-emergent herbicide. If you're trying to control weeds after they're already up um, with an herbicide, that's pretty difficult. And a lot of people will, will waste a lot of time and money 
But there are also um, situations where you might put out an herbicide that could do damage to your desirable turf grass species. So give us a call about specifics and we can help you. But we will work on a common weed um, webinar for you. David asked about centipede grass. So centipede grass is an old Florida grass. It is a warm season grass. It looks a little bit similar to St. Augustine grass, somewhere in between St. Augustine and Zoysia. Um, not incredibly common. I've probably in five and a half years seen it come into my office one time. Overall, very little problems when it comes to um, pests or diseases. Again, it likes to have um, lots of sun, um, seven to eight hours of full sun. Similar management requirements, um, three, at least three inches in height. Um, ir Irrigation is going to be the same when it comes to fertilization, two to three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Not real common anymore though, David. Um, Ray, I used annual rye never again. Yeah, it's always a risk. It's a risk. Is the grass dying because we cut the grass, we didn't remove the grass? No, I don't think that's going to be an issue for you, um, uh, Delilah. Uh, again, grass clippings, as long as they're not clumped up, because it was wet or something are not going to be an issue um, for us whatsoever. Those are going to decompose quick. Um, Ray, this was a great class. Thank you. It was great. Thank you, Judith. Um, and let's see. Just moved into a home. I can see good, see the good St. Augustine that's been mistreated and I don't mind trying to get it back. When do you give up and resod? Oh, goodness, that's a good question. Um, what I would suggest to you, Asia, is to give us a call. Let us walk through this with you. There's probably a lot of variables for us to discuss, um, to be honest. If, if I start to see anything less than 60, 55, 60% coverage of St. Augustine grass, I might consider resodding at that time, depending on how big of an area it is. If it's a smaller area that you're having trouble with, and you feel like you can kind of baby that St. Augustine grass that's there, control weeds um, and kind of baby it along, it will grow in over time. And if you can keep that St. Augustine grass that's there happy and healthy, it, it will kind of take care of itself and fill in those bare areas. So if you want to have a, a little bit deeper discussion, give us a call and we're happy to talk with it. But if you've got a good 60% 60, 60 coverage, I, I would give it a go. It sounds like you're, you're kind of paying attention and, and might be willing to work with what you've got. So you might be able to save yourself some money and not resod. Or the alternative is to um, just maybe if you've got very small spots, just resod the small areas. Clean those up, remove any um, dead turf grass in those areas cut those kind of patches out and just patch in with some small pieces of sod. So a lot of different variables in the discussion. How big of an area, what's the overall coverage, what's your management level and, and um, desire and ability to work in it and take care of it over time will determine that. Um, Jordan, my mom loves your accents. Thanks, it's cute. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that, my, my Kentucky accent. Um, uh, let's see, uh, make sure I don't miss any questions. I can see the good grass between weeds and nut sedge. I've been removing them. That's pretty much your best bet, um, is as is, is much hand removal as you possibly can do. Nut sedge is, um, a little bit more difficult than some of the other weeds to control and you have to use different chemicals to do that compared to some of the other weeds. And again, we can definitely help you with that, with specifics um, to make sure you're putting your uh, treating at the right time of the year and with the right um, chemicals. Not everything will um, uh, help with nut sedge. So some of the more um, common um, herb uh, herbicides are not going to be effective against nut sedge, whereas they would be with some of the others. We have sedges, thank you for sharing forward to these meetings. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all. Good way to get rid of wild Bermuda. Oh my goodness, Virginia, if we could figure that out, we would both be rich together. Um, 
you know, Bermuda grass, especially common Bermuda, is certainly a weed in most people's opinion. Of course, a weed is just any plant with an unhappy owner. But, um, you know, Bermuda grass, unfortunately, you can hit it over and over and over again with something like glyphosate, and it will just keep coming back. Unfortunately, hand removal, constant removal, and application of herbicides is about the only thing you can do, but you do have to be careful um, with the herbicides because um, there are no selective herbicides to control Bermuda that will not ha damage your um, desired turf grass. Um, Pam, thank you. Well organized, packed with information. Excellent. All right, folks. So that's the last. Um, come to my house. I'll buy you lunch. I wish I could. That would be awesome, Asia. Just give us a call, and we'll we'll happily uh, help you. All right, folks. So we're going to go ahead and end the presentation. I hope you learned a lot and you had a lot of fun. And again, we will um, try our best to get make sure this is recorded and loaded onto our website. So just give us 